at the end of the night, we went back to our hotel room and I was taking a shower and I was in the shower and I literally like fell over because my heart was hurting so bad. Like I felt like my whole chest was gonna explode. And I went outside and I was like keeling over. I could barely stand up. I was in so much freaking pain. And so this stranger took me to the hospital. I was laying in the bed and the doctor came over to talk to me. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, if you don't stop doing drugs, you're gonna die. I'm Rory Satya and I'm 31 and currently I'm a student in psychology. I started doing drugs when I was 12. I started with drinking and pretty much immediately after I wanted to try anything else that I could try. It's kind of like you feel a sense of peace, like all the things that were bothering me, all of the anxiety and the stress and the fear and the anger and the resentment, just like was gone. Nothing mattered. And yeah, so in that moment I was like, oh, this is it. This is what I've been missing. This is what I need. This is what I should be doing. I made another friend and she also had a pretty sh shitty home life like I did. And yeah, we instantly were like, okay, well, let's go smoke weed. And we're like, we're gonna smoke weed until our eyes turn red so that we definitely get high. I finally felt like this is something I have. This is my world, this is my escape. And so we did that. And then it wasn't long after that we wanted to do ecstasy and at some point, we even thought it would be a great idea to go buy crack. Right before high school, I met some guys with my friend. We did a bunch of drugs with them and then they like locked us in their basement. And like, sexually assaulted us. It was like a obviously very shitty experience. I think this is like maybe the middle of grade nine. And the day after that, I kind of started to think about things differently and realized that I was going down a pretty bad path. So it was kind of this moment of clarity. And I remember walking through a park near my house in the morning after I'd left their house when we finally were allowed to leave. And thinking like, what am I doing? <laughs> How is my life like this? How has it gotten to this point? Even my friend who was there that it happened with, she said it didn't happen. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to my mom about it because I didn't want to upset her. I just felt like I couldn't fit in with regular kids at that point because I had no way to talk to them because they just had this great life with their family and I just felt so lonely and I felt so bad about myself. I just gave up, I guess, on trying to change my life around at that point because I was so uncomfortable in my mind and in my skin. So I moved all the time. Like every couple months I would move to a new place. I'd go on a lot of trips. I started working at music festivals so that I had an excuse to always be at a party so that I could always be loaded. And trying to just get those little moments of like, <sighs> it's gonna be okay. And eventually I found my DOC, which is like something people in the recovery world term we use and it means drug of choice. So I found my drug of choice, which was ketamine. I just knew that I liked it too much. I had been dating this person who was a drug dealer. And so I was getting my drugs at cost, which made it really accessible. 
and I started doing more and more and more like all day long like an insane amount like every 10 minutes truly and I wanted to stop and I just felt like fuck <laughs> if I do this that means I'm giving up my entire life everyone I've known for years and years and years and at that point those people were my family because I wasn't connected to my family at all and I lasted three months and then uh, my friends came home drunk one night and they're like come on you can drink like whatever whatever and I was like no no I can't and they just at that point started to peer pressure me again like not that they were trying to but they just didn't really understand what I was going through and they're like you never really drank anyways like it's not a big deal it's just alcohol like everyone drinks and that thought started to plant in my mind again and I didn't drink that night I went out a couple days later on a date and I decided like oh you know what yeah I could just have one drink like I didn't like drinking I don't even like alcohol I don't like being drunk so why would it matter if I drink which now <laughs> that I'm like years and years sober I'm like that's the most insane thought ever how can I sit there and tell myself I don't like this at all so I might as well do it <laughs> Clearly, I was just, you know, I'd passed that point where I was, like, able to stay sober again. And I spent the next year trying to secretly do drugs without anybody knowing. And I would have my drug dealer, some random person I met, sneak into my backyard in the middle of the night and hide my drugs under a fucking rock <laughs> so that I could, like, sneak down really early in the morning before anyone woke up and get my drugs. I remember telling myself, like, I'm just gonna go one year because this feels impossible. <laughs> I'll just do one year and then if I can't make it, I'll, I'll give up. I took this inventory of myself and my life and that helped me understand why I was in so much pain and why I was so angry and why I was so uncomfortable. And I then did another inventory where I write about everything I've ever done wrong in my life and I learned that I can make up for it, which really helped me process my emotions, something I'd never really learned how to do. So whenever I was angry or frustrated or scared or alone, instead of getting high, I would literally just sit down and close my eyes and breathe and ask for strength and ask for support and pray to get through it. The first year was tough. I prayed every single day. I went to meetings every single day. Anytime I would start getting wrapped up in my head and self-critical and self-obsessing and thinking all these negative things about myself and all these things about how uncomfortable I was, I'd be like, I wonder how my friend's doing. I know they're having a hard time, so I would call them and ask them, how are you? Is there anything I can do to help you? And if no one in my life needed help, okay, show up and volunteer. Over the course of the year, you do these things they start to become second nature. Now I'm here like seven years later.